Hey, so on this video, we're going to learn how data classes work in Kotlin and how you can get this little tiny piece of code to generate all this. We're going to decompile and show the Java also generated from Kotlin. So hopefully if you've ever worked the JVM code, you've heard of Kotlin. There are a lot of runners up that are alternatives for JVM, like you have Groovy, you have Scala. I think Kotlin is probably the closest you can get to Java without all the annoyances. So yeah, if, you, if you're if you on this video, you probably already know a little bit about Kotlin, but uh, you can check it out on Kotlin.lang. And actually the uh, the makers of the language are the same makers of uh, the famous uh, IDE uh, IntelliJ. So why are we starting with data classes? Data classes are very simple. We can accomplish them in pretty much one line of code. And then they're easily interoperable with our Java existing code bases. Data classes provide quite a bit of functionality right out of the box. The auto generator getters and setters are equals in our hash code, which typically we have to either write by hand or have our IDEs auto generate for us. So now placing these in a map or other structures where equality is, is necessary is automatic for us. You could accomplish this with other third-party tools like Lombok, but you'll find them a bit more cumbersome than using Kotlin as it is. Lombok also requires writing quite a bit more code than just writing a one-line data class in Kotlin, as you'll see. With this example, I'm showing basically how a data class can really can make your code concise. You can see here everything on the left is uh, the equivalent in Java to create this same functionality this data class provides in Kotlin. So you get all your equals, your hash code, all your getters and setters, all automatically. So you can call this from Java just as if it was this class on the left. And a pretty cool way to kind of show you <laughs> the Java that's generated is through the Kotlin plugin. So to show the Java code generated, well the JVM uh, bytecode generated from Kotlin and thus the Java that you can decompile, you can use the Kotlin plugin and first you have to make sure you have the Kotlin file you want uh, decompile selected. So you just have your cursor there. You can go to tools, Kotlin, show Kotlin bytecode. And here I'll show the Kotlin bytecode which isn't really that useful unless you understand all the compiled uh, JVM code. You can hit decompile to see the actual class, which is still a lot less readable than what's on the left, but you get an idea of everything that's happening. And you can see these not nulls here. This is a, this is a good example of uh, the how the uh, unknowable types work. So you can see that it actually provides this annotation. So if in Java you were to pass a, a null to this, you would, uh, you would get a, a null pointer exception. Um, luckily though, the JVM will actually give you warnings, which I'll show later um, if you were to try to do that. So at least when you compile, it'll show that. So that all this is what's generated from just this one line of code. Alright guys, so I promised I would show an example of what happens when you pass null from Java to a non-nullable type. So here we go. So as you can see here, this is an error. Um, it has a warning here. If you look a little closer, let me have it pop up passing a null argument to something annotated with not null. And I think before I said by mistake that it would throw a null pointer exception, but actually what it does is throw an illegal argument exception. So you can see here, we'll throw, if I run this test, because this test won't pass unless it throws this. So, okay, as you can see here. So now, what is it? what happens? So let's take a look at the constructor here. This is what's being called, and it is right here. And in this case, you can see weight is null. So that means right here is annotated with not null, and because it's null, they're passed to it, it throws a, a uh, illegal argument exception. So this is the decompiled code we looked at earlier. So it's all just from this one, one line of code. And it, not to say you, you have to use just one line of the data class, you can make them longer. So you can span out the, uh, the class like you would in the other class. So you can add extra, you know, functions here and have them do whatever you want. So it's still just a regular class so you can do anything you want with, but the data modifier is what's important here because this is what actually adds the automatic get, set, uh, equals, and hash code. So yeah, 
So uh, also, um, if you and, and if you don't even have the data class uh, mana fire, it will automatically add your getters and setters in column. But I guess the important thing is just the uh, equals and hash code, because those can be uh, a burden to maintain, even if they're auto generated by the ID. You have to remember to generate them each time. So. So what do I mean by that, by regenerating and how that be a burden? Well, anytime you change in these arguments in the Java world, so uh, actually the arguments, but the uh, just the actual members of the class, you'd have to regenerate the equals and hash code and remember to do that. So a common error is that people don't remember to do that. And then your equals and hash code uh, will be incorrect. So you'll get really weird behaviors, like some uh, classes that are just ignoring a certain uh, member when determining quality and uh, representing the hash code, so you get really bizarre uh, issues when you uh, input into maps and things like that. So, so now that we know the behavior of non-nullable types, let's talk about what they are. So here um, is an example of what will be a nullable type. In Kotlin, you just add a question mark at the end of the type to indicate that you can actually have a null in that type. So when it's actually being used later on to actually do something with, you have to account for that. So in Kotlin, you'll do stuff like this. So this is a string. So in order to actually call any kind of string functions on like length, you have to put a question mark in front to ensure it's not null before you actually call it. Or you do you can actually do an if sound is not equal to null as well. But that's not a, really a functional syntax, but it's not as Kotliny. But here you go. That'll still work as well. So, here, if we take this off, what will happen? So you can see you get a compile time error. You're not allowed to do that. You could do something like this, but don't do that. You can do that in tests and things like that, but in production code, you definitely don't want to assert something's not null. If you were to do that instead, you should probably just have consider that the class should not have null to begin with, and you would just make this a non-nullable type with this and all that, right? You may have noticed that warning when I had the if check there for null. Colin actually uh, warns you about that, so you, it, it recommends that you can change it into a, a more uh, colony syntax. So if I did this automatic conversion, you can see now it looks like a uh, a, uh, a normal Kotlin style uh, null check. All right, so let's summarize this all and some key takeaways. So uh, first of all, Colin's awesome. Uh, mostly annoying things from Java are automated, uh, as we already discussed. Uh, the hash code equals getter setters, all automatable. Uh, Colin forces you to handle all your nulls. If you don't do it, you get compile time errors, so that'll stop you right there. Uh, nice for catching a lot of errors. And also, Java will give you warnings too uh, if you try to pass nulls to a non nullable type uh, in the Colin world from Java. Colin has default values and constructors. If you don't know if you noticed that earlier, but uh, we uh, showed an example of that right here. So, if sound isn't set, it's null. Uh, Kotlin classes can be used as small as one line of code, so that's quite a big change from Java. Uh, a lot less boilerplate, which is pretty nice. And I suggest taking out the, uh, the JVM bytecode using the Kotlin plugin to uh, decompile and just kind of see what it does and uh, what's next. So I suggest taking out the, uh, the links I have in the description below. Download IntelliJ, uh, get the code from this video uh, from GitHub, uh, create your own data class experiment. Uh, that's how you learn the code. Um, and in our new languages. And so, uh, and then complete the suggestions in that repo as well. I have a lesson one with exercises on that. So, yeah. Awesome. Well, that was a lot of fun. So, just uh, let me know if you have any questions on uh, Kotlin or anything I may have left out, or what do you want to learn next? So, uh, just let me know in the comments below. Hope to see you soon.